So I'm going to talk about my experiences over the last seven years since I decided to change my mind. And I just have to correct one thing about that Jeff got wrong in his lecture this morning. The golden era of ketone research starts with a paper by Noakes, Kuslug, and Sloan in 1980. <laughs> and, <laughs> and here it is. <laughs> the famous forgotten study, post-exercise ketosis. And this happened at a time when we were heavily involved in carbohydrate loading. And, but we would, the way we would load for marathons is we would do three days of carbohydrate depletion where you wouldn't eat carbohydrates and you'd run as far as you could. And then for three days, you'd carbohydrate load. And my friend, Johan Kuslak, came to me and he said, I'm really interested in ketosis because it's never been studied. So I said, well, my wife tells me I tell, smell terrible in the carbohydrate depletion phase of this, maybe there's something to do with carbohydrates and ketones, and if you stop eating ket carbohydrates, you get ketotic. So we did some experiments, and the, when it can move, sorry, I'm not pointing it right, there we go. So I'm very proud because I was one of the subjects, and what we did was for, for a day, sorry, we would carbohydrate load, or we would do a low carbohydrate diet, there's the low carbohydrate diet, and we would run for two hours on a treadmill, and then we got this fabulous ketosis, which we would then reverse if we ate carbohydrates. That was the next study. And when we had no exercise, we didn't become ketotic, and we ate lots of carbohydrates and ran, we didn't become ketotic. Obviously, everyone knows, but in those days, we didn't know, actually. This was the first study of ketosis, post-exercise ketosis, since the 1930s. But what was really interesting was to find out why I was not going to be so healthy in due course. Because when we looked at the insulin levels and glucose levels, and remember there were two of us, so it was me and my friend, what we noticed was that on the, here the free fatty acids you'd expect, they go up when you're on the low carbohydrate diet, etc. But look at this glucose response. On the high carbohydrate diet, we showed an abnormal response, which, which I didn't, no one noticed that. But glucose shouldn't shoot up like that on a high carbohydrate diet. On the low carbohydrate diet, it was bad for the first hour, but then it improved. But look at the insulins. This is on the low carbohydrate, the insulin is reasonably low. When we didn't do any exercise, look at it. This person is profoundly insulin resistant. And we didn't know what it was. So I was profoundly insulin resistant at the age of 28, despite being lean and running marathons and running 140 kilometers a week, about 70, 80 miles a week. I was profoundly insulin resistant. Look at this. After a day of no exercise and no food, we didn't eat that day. Look at this. I'm still, my insulin's still way too high. Today it's much lower because I don't eat carbohydrates. So I was, I was destined to develop type 2 diabetes, but no one knew and no one picked it up. So I use that as a good example. And one thing, if you want to do research, you know, people need to watch the glucose response to exercise in people who are insulin resistant. I think that's an early detector for insulin resistance is you should monitor always glucose after the end of a maximum test, exercise test. It should be normal. If it's not, I suspect you're going to have some insulin resistance. Just a hypothesis. So what happened next to me Next uh, was, the, sorry, so Tim Noakes and friend have insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, despite youth and marathon training. It improved on the high-fat diet. They must develop type 2 diabetes with time if they continue eating a high-carbohydrate diet. So I continued to eat the high-carbohydrate diet for 33 years, and the consequence was, was obvious. So now we just go a little bit forward. Next year, this is a picture I graduated with a doctorate in, in medicine, and he has my mother and my father. My father has just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And he's put on the high carbohydrate diet, and 10 years later, he's dead from the disease. And I watched him die, and there's nothing worse than dying from type 2 diabetes. He had strokes when he died. He could not speak to me. He lost both his legs. And this was a wonderful, wonderful man, a very powerful, charismatic person, an absolute icon in, in my country. And uh, I couldn't help him. And so I carry that burden that I could not help him. And much of why I'd, what I do is because I'm inspired by what he gave to me and the fact that I couldn't pay back to him. So now, 
It turns out that I discovered I've got type 2 diabetes about seven years ago, and I realized I've got 10 years. 10 years or else I'm going to be his position. And now seven years down the line, I'm glad to report that my diabetes is in remission or in reversal, whatever you choose. And so I've been able to do it. It took me seven years of a very low carbohydrate diet to do it. But I'm thankful to those people who put me on the right path. And the people who put me on the right path were these guys, Eric Westman, Steve Finney, and Jeff Ehrlich. And the story is, one day, the day I sent off Waterlog to be published and sent it to the editors, I hadn't been running much. And my brain told me, you must get up tomorrow morning, and you must run, and you must not stop running for the rest of your life. So I got up, and I ran, and I had a terrible run. And I was, we got a tiny little hill outside my house. And I, when I reached the top of the hill, which is tiny, I thought I was on top of summit of Mount Everest. I felt so terrible. <laughs> so, so I went back and I opened my emails and there was an advert for this book. I mean, how, how, is, how probable is that to happen? I was at the moment I needed help, the book was being advertised. And I was so angry. <laughs> I was so angry when I read it because I said, this guy, Atkins, he's a crook and a thief and everything. And these three people have sold out to him, and they're good scientists, and that's a disgrace. So I was so angry. I got in the car and drove to the local bookshop, and I, they had the last copy of the book, and I picked it up. And in my anger, I tore it open and started reading it and, and like this. And, and after two hours, I said, oh, my gosh, I got it all wrong. I said, for 33 years, I've been completely wrong. And I said, that's it. No more carbohydrates ever. And I had my last low, low carbohydrates that day and converted to the diet immediately. And the response for me was spectacular. And as I said, it's seven years and my diabetes is in remission. But this book uh, was an, is an astonishing book. I think that's the best diet book that I've ever read. And he describes insulin resistance in great detail and all the symptoms you develop. And it's a book that really one needs to read. So when I say they saved my life, they did. Because 10 years later, if I hadn't read this book, I would be on insulin, I'd be weighing 240, 250 kilograms, I wouldn't be able to do exercise, and my brain would have gone and other things would have gone. So that's, thank you guys. You, you're the start of whatever else I might have achieved, I owe it to you. So anyway, so I changed my diet and I knew there'd be a backlash. And this book is the second edition of, of this book. And in the interim, the first edition didn't do so well, so they said, why don't you spice it up a bit? So I said, yeah, okay, I'll write about the diet, you see? So, so here it has, how a low-carbohydrate, high-protein diet will improve your life. That was the addition to the book. And immediately, it's, it opened up a can of worms, and the cardiologist went for me immediately, because I said, you maybe statins aren't such a good idea. So they targeted me first, and then, then I wrote this article, because people were writing to me, and they were saying, Prof, my diabetes is in remission or whatever. And I took 127 of the stories and I analyzed them. And I said, listen, this is just anecdotes, but they're important. I had four people describe they'd reversed their type 2 diabetes. This is 9, 20, 2013. And I thought, my gosh, that's really important. Won't my profession love it to be told that you can reverse type 2 diabetes? And there was one person, one person lost 260 pounds in seven months just by changing this diet. The first week he lost three kilograms. One, one week he lost 12 pounds in one week. I mean, I don't know how it happened. Anyway, and I thought they would love it. Do you know what? My university tried to get this paper retracted because I didn't have ethical approval to write these things about these people because I didn't ask each of them for ethical permission to, to include their information. And, and I, I never said it was hard science. I said a randomized clin controlled clinical trial is urgently required to disprove the hypothesis that the LCHF eating plan can reverse cases of type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and hypertension without pharmacotherapy. And now, fortunately, we heard the Verde Health study. But that's all I was saying. And they wanted to, to stop the article. The next thing we did was we wrote this book. And this is a really interesting guy, study because the, this guy is a long distance runner. And he and a friend were running the length of the wall of China. 
And they got into Mongolia and they ran out of food and they were really struggling. And they spoke to the Mongolians and this, the Mongolians said, only one way you're gonna finish this, you eat pork fat, that's all. Pork fat from now till the end and you'll be fine. So they ate pork fat and everything was fantastic. <laughs> so they came back and they said, we should write a book to promote a real, the real foods, a high fat diet for athletes. And it took us five weeks. Now, normally it takes me years to write a book. We wrote this book in five weeks, and we published it, and it just went ballistic in South Africa. And it sold many, many copies and completely changed the nature of the dietary debate in South Africa. Now, the public were asking. They were all talking about this low-fat, low-carbohydrate low diet, and we call it the Banting diet in South Africa. And unfortunately, the dietitians responded in a negative way. They didn't say embrace it. They said, no, it's all wrong. You're going to die if you eat the diet. And the public didn't believe them because the public was benefiting so much. And so we call it the Banting diet. Sorry, this is all it said. This is the, 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 the genius of this book is this table, the green foods. These are the green list of foods. And that's, it. that's the genius of the book. As long as you eat these foods, you live forever. So, so that's what we didn't promise it, but that's what we said. And it's so easy if you've got your green list, you can, can do it. And then the, the book was named after, the, we call the diet the Banting diet, after Mr. Banting, who very kindly sent me these two pictures of himself. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and this is his before the diet, and that's after the diet. And he lost about 40 pounds, as you can see, and then wrote this book, which became very popular. So. It was, it was really interesting in South Africa. We, the night before the book went to the publishers, the, one of the authors, he changed LCHF and he just put Banting. And that really gave it legs because the Banting name now meant something. And if you talk in South Africa, we don't talk LCHF, it's, it's the Banting diet. Okay, so now what happens? So, so what happens is I now go and speak to Parliament and there's a picture of me handing the real meal revolution to the Speaker of Parliament. And my university thinks this is the worst thing that's ever happened to the university in its history, in its 100-year history, to have Noakes promoting a diet to the Parliament. And the four professors decide to write this letter, and they send it to the Cape Times. So I wake up one morning warned that this letter is going to appear in the Cape Times, which is our major newspaper in the Cape Town, on the Monday morning. And this is what it says. This has never happened before in the history of my university. It is therefore a serious concern that Professor Timothy Noakes, a colleague respected for his research in sports science, is aggressively promoting the diet as a revolution. I'm not promoting the diet. I wrote a book. The South Africans promoted the book for me. I did not need to promote it making outrageous, unproven claims about disease prevention. I did not make any claims. All I said was these people reported that they'd reversed their type 2 diabetes or their hypertension on the diet. I made no claim. I said what they said. Maligning the integrity and credibility of peers who criticize this diet for being evidence deficient and not conforming to the tenets of good and responsible science. I never said that. They were talking like that about me. I never once criticized a colleague publicly for that. And then this goes against the University of Cape Town's commitment to academic freedom as a prerequisite to fostering responsible and respectful intellectual debate and free inquiry. Now, that is George Orwellian speech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't need to explain what I mean. They were shutting down freedom of speech. And it got worse. So... The UCD's Faculty of Health Sciences, a leading research institute in Africa, has a reputation for research excellent to uphold, which I'd contributed to that, by the way. <laughs> Above all, our research must be socially responsible. We have therefore taken the unusual step of distancing ourselves from the proponents of this diet. Now, that has never happened to anyone at that university in its long history. So why would they choose me? Now, I didn't understand at the time that this is called mobbing, academic mobbing. And this article describes academic mobbing, which is a horrendous event. This lady committed suicide with her husband when she was mobbed. She's from a Can Canadian university. She could not take it, the pressure of mobbing. 
I could take it because I was no longer in the university, I was retired. But this is how they describe mobbing. And this is, this is what it feels like if you ever mobbed. An impassioned collective campaign by co-workers to exclude, punish, and humiliate a targeted worker, initiated most often by a person in position of power, of influence. It was started by my dean of the Faculty of Medicine. Mobbing is a desperate urge to crush and eliminate the target. The urge travels through the workplace like a virus, infecting one person after another. The target comes to be viewed as absolutely abhorrent with no redeeming qualities, outside the circle of acceptance and respectability, deserving only of contempt. As the campaign proceeds, a steadily larger range of hostile ploys and communications comes to be seen as legitimate. And that's what happened to me. Anything they did after that was, was justified. Didn't matter how humiliating it was, whatever they did. And you know, that's, it's a frightening book when you read it, or article when you read it, but to be exposed to this is terrible. And the worst thing is the people who are closest to you have to prove to the mob that they have distanced themselves most from you. So the people I'd helped the most were the ones who were the most horrid to me. Yeah, and just, so just think of that. I, I survived because of my wife. And what the target of, of the mobbing is is firstly, they isolate you. I was isolated completely from my university and my faculty, including the Sports Science Institute, which I'd helped build, because they didn't support me either. I had one person supporting me directly, and it was my wife. And the focus is to break you from your wife, because then you, you're finished. And if we had broken, I probably would have committed suicide. You know, but we were too strong for them. And she's the reason that I survived. And we fought it, we decided we're gonna fight this thing, whatever happens and we're gonna come out on top in the end. And uh, fortunately, that's what happened. So then what happened was I get charged for, for unprofessional conduct. And in the middle of my testimony, this is what the newspaper said. So I said, Twitter has great value, etc. in science. So, so it all circulates on my Twitter account. And so if you don't follow me, you might want to know why do I use Twitter and why do I think it's such an important social media? And firstly, I use it for information sharing. It is the easiest and best way to share information. My own personal education, I probably photocopy or print out three or five paper, new articles a day from what I pick up. And it, it, I mean, it's just, it's overwhelming all the information. And that's one of the problems because there's so much information on this diet coming through that it's difficult to know what you should be talking about. And then I also use it and I, um, for challenging conventional dietary guidelines. I like to promote the science supporting the medical benefits of the low carbohydrate banting lifestyle and to highlight the failings of the current pharmacological model of chronic disease management. So that's, that's why I'm on Twitter. So what happened was that on February the 3rd, 2014, Pippa Lienstra tweeted this. And so she's a mother, she's, her husband is, has read The Real Meal Revolution and is doing the low carb diet. And she asks, is low carb, high fat eating okay for breastfeeding moms, worried about all the dairy and cauliflower win for babies, question mark, question mark. And she writes to two people, not me, and it's not Dr. Noakes, it's Professor. And on my Twitter handle, it does not say I'm a medical doctor says I'm a scientist. And she asked a question of two of, ad, it's this plural, that's critically important, mums and babies, that's critical to the whole defense. And so here's my answer, baby doesn't eat the dairy and cauliflower, that's statement of fact, just very healthy high fat breast milk, so I'm promoting breastfeeding, and then I make the error, and these seven words are the problem. Key is to wean, I couldn't even, didn't know how to spell weaning, baby onto LCHF. And that was the seven word tweet that became the most expensive tweet in the history of tweet them. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so within, within nine hours, this lady, who happens to be the head of the Association for Dietitians in South Africa, complains to the Health Professional Council. So I'm registered with the Health Professional Council because I'm a doctor. And so she writes to them and she says, to whom it may concern, I would like to file a complaint against Noakes. He's giving incorrect medical blah, blah on Twitter that is not evidence-based. I have attached a tweet where Professor Noakes advised a breastfeeding mother to wean her baby onto low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. 
I urge the HPCSA to please take urgent actions against this type of misconduct, as Professor Noakes is a celebrity, and they don't, the public doesn't have the knowledge to understand that the information he is advocating is not evidence-based. It's dangerous to give this advice, for instance, that for infants and can potentially, potentially be life-threatening. I await your response. So a few days later, I receive a letter from the Health Professional Council saying this is the complaint and you have to defend it. So I, I laughed because she didn't give any evidence. There's no evidence here about what I said was dangerous. Where's the evidence? You can't make a charge without providing evidence. And I wrote a long letter and I thought it would be the end of it, but then I began to realize things were taking off behind the scenes. So eventually I get charged. And this is the charge, the biomedical ethical issue. I acted disgracefully because I abused the doctor-patient relationship by offering medical advice on social media to a patient and her infant without first examining the healthy infant. So that's the charge. And also that the medical advice I preferred was not only wrong, it was unconventional, not evidence-based, but it was also dangerous, even though there was never any evidence or claim of harm. So the problem that they faced was that, or this is the way they used a circular argument, providing medical information on Twitter represents disgraceful conduct because it's not possible to examine the patient on Twitter. But if it's not possible to examine the patient on Twitter, then it's not possible to have a doctor-patient relationship on Twitter. <laughs> and the argument went round and round and round, as, as I'll show. So four years later, during the appeal, which we had in the earlier this year, the HPCSA finally dropped any pretense that a doctor-patient relationship existed. They realized they'd lost that case. So what did they say? They now argue that the weaning advice was dangerous to millions and millions of Twitter followers. And so now it's been charged with killing millions of people and giving them the wrong advice on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so what next happens is, is so when you're charged, it goes to a preliminary committee, and these geniuses were the guys who were going to decide whether they should charge me or not. Now, what they're meant to do is that they collect the information, and then they send, they've got all this information, they send it to me, I respond, and then they call me, and I must present to them. I was never given that. And that is the South African Constitution says that has to happen. This lady is the head of ethics at one of the major South African universities. She broke all ethical rules for a number of things that she did. But she did not give me the right to hear the, the charge that made against me, which is against the Constitution of South Africa. And they, then they started, make, this guy, <laughs> who I've known since I was this high, he decides he's going to make sure I get charged and he's going to sort out all the expert witnesses. Now, that's not his job. He must just decide whether to charge me or not. So anyway, the question was, what did they know about Twitter? And the answer was nothing. None of them had ever had any interest in Twitter. And so that was, so anyway, they then decided on the basis of me not being allowed to defend myself that they were gonna charge me and the charge went forward. So here are the problems that they faced. The first one is answer, I answered a we question. And the thing about a we question is, which means I was providing general medical information and not medical advice. I'm just giving <laughs> medical information. For example, medical information, if you got up and asked me, Doc, Professor Noakes, is it right for runners to stretch before they go training in the mornings? I, that's medical information. It's not medical advice. If I lost the case, none of you would ever be able to answer that question in public again because you would be giving so-called medical advice, not medical information, and you'd have to examine every patient before you gave that advice. Yeah, yeah. And hence, there could not be a doctor-patient relationship. Uh, there was no doctor-patient relationship. We proved that in many ways. So here was the opinion of a South African who was president of the South African Medical Association. He made a very, very obvious point. Today, all medical advice outlets are ubiquitous all across the globe by both print and electronic media, but it's never been suggested that Dr. Oz has a doctor-patient relationship with his viewers. <laughs> Etc. Now, see, if I'd lost the case, poor old Dr. Oz could not appear anymore, <laughs> technically, <laughs> at least in South Africa. And you would not be able to give a public lecture and you wouldn't be able to write a book because that would be giving medical advice. And the only way you could do it, you have to examine everyone who reads your book and then you can give them the advice. <laughs> so, so why was I treated differently? And is it to set an historical precedent? And I don't know. All I can tell you is that industry was strongly involved in the case against me. 
and you can probably guess which industries they were. <laughs> so th there was no doctor patient. The information I provided is entirely compatible with the South African and international guidelines for complementary feeding, weaning of children. This is astonishing. What I said was absolutely gold standard right advice. So let's look at that. He has complementary feeding, a critical window. This is in the South African Medical Journal, written by all the top experts in South Africa. And what do they say? Provide a variety of foods. Meat, poultry, fish, and eggs should be eaten daily or as often as possible. That's, that's what I said. So then we go on. The Association for Dietitians of South Africa, which was also part of the charge against me. What are their guidelines? Foods from animals should be eaten daily or as often as possible to meet protein and iron needs. Okay, so, and then the best was this lady, because she was the expert witness for the prosecution. They used all her evidence to charge me. And the best moment, I'm going to introduce Rocky Ramdas to you in a second or two. And so when she came to give the expert witness, by the way, Rocky, well, I'll show you now, but we just had such a fabulous relationship. He once cross-examined me, and I was in five minutes, I couldn't speak anymore. <laughs> but she came up. And so he, he asked her, so Professor Forster, what's your training? Now I have a BSc in home economics and a, and a PhD in, in physiology. So, so what does that qualify you as a dietitian? Have you ever treated anyone with di for dietary? No, 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 et cetera. It got worse than that because she also gave evidence on ethics. So he said, what training do you have? Ethics, nothing. Have you ever researched a low-carbohydrate diet? No. Have you ever prescribed a diet for anyone? No. So then he said, well, what are you doing here then? <laughs> that was the first five minutes. And, and, and she'd never been cross-examined in her life by any student or anyone. And it was, she said things to me afterwards, which I can't even repeat. <laughs> so what does she say? From six months of age, give your child meat, chicken, fish, or eggs every day or as often as possible. So she didn't know what her guidelines were either. Okay. So there we go, there's Professor Forster. And this is, this is our guidelines. Meat, poultry, game, all eggs, and offal, all seafood, and they're all the vegetables. That's it. That's the real meal revolution diet for weaning of children. <laughs> so the, the third one was no one suffered any harm. Mrs. Leonstrad did not come follow the advice, nor did she lay the complaint, which is astonishing. The first time someone is charged and the person who lays the complaint doesn't suffer harm and isn't present. And so she very kindly wrote to, wrote to the newspapers. Uh, she never, and, and I apologize, it's in Afrikaans, but this means she didn't give a damn, if you mind, excuse me. <laughs> she says, that's what she says. In the Noakes case, I don't give a damn. That was her. And here's her, her son who was not put on the Banting diet. And he looks okay, but probably would look a bit better if he'd been weaned on. <laughs> And in the end, we proved that the complaint was laid as part of a collusion between ADSA and the Health Professional Council with the purpose of silencing me, that is denying me my constitutional right of freedom of speech because before I'd even sent the tweet, the head of ADSA was talking to the Health Professional Council to try to shut me up. So we discovered these, this was an incriminating email. This is the lady who laid the charge. She's president of the Association for Dietetics in South Africa. And she writes to this lady who serves on the Health Professional Council as a representative for nutrition and dietetics in South Africa. This is before I've tweeted. And, and she says, Tim Noakes' impact on the dietetics profession. Here are other examples of what other people are writing about dietitians to the negative attention we're getting from Tim Noakes. There was no negative attention. I was just wrote a book, that's all. The article below attacks the dietitian, but is written by someone else. And it was a very stinging article, which she'd made her very unhappy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it goes on before the trial even happens. So the trial begins. Sorry, I think the battery's running out here. Yeah, I think the battery's died. There we go. OK. So this is now a year before the trial starts. A year before the trial starts, she writes, uh, she ha we've had a meeting with the senior legal person at, at the HPCSA, and he says we've got a plan for Dr. Noakes. This is a year before the trial begins. So that was the collusion. And then, so then she writes back a few days later, or sorry, a few hours later. Yeah, I think the battery's really struggling here. There we go. 
And thank you for your email. This is now the fourth before the trial begins, a year before the trial begins. I just feel that the process takes very long and the damage gets worse and worse. Dietitians contact me daily and I feel that I don't have support from the HBCSA. I'm glad it's been discussed. Can you possibly give me an indication of what the timelines are when we can expect action taken? Thanks so much. So that was it. So it was a, it was a setup and which had nothing to do with the tweet. It had the fact that the, that the dietetics, dietitians were unhappy with what was happening. So in the end, the trial lasted more than four years and cost an estimated $1 million for all parties. Perhaps its great legacy will have to have brought the LCHF diet to an even larger global audience. So I must finalize by thanking a couple of people. This is my, my team. Uh, three, three guys here, just absolutely. Mike van der Nest and Rocky Ramdas, who gave their time for me for free. They gave me probably at least a million dollars free cover. Yeah. And they, they're two of the most eloquent, the best lawyers in South Africa. And Mike phoned me and he said, Tim, it's a witch hunt. I'm going to defend you. And Rocky, I'll show you in a second. So here's Rocky and myself. And we had four great years together. <laughs> and we're now brothers. And here we are sitting at the trial. And we, were, we would present the evidence. And uh, we'd been through it. And you know, he, he literally read the transcripts, I think, five times. He was just a meticulous man. And uh, just, I can't thank him enough. And he's a Hindu, and, he's, and this is a verdict definition of a man of God, softer than the flower where kindness is concerned, and you can see the kindness in his face, stronger than the thunder where principles are at stake. And that was it. He nailed those. The poor old uh, prosecution witnesses got nailed. Now, why is he called Rocky? Well, there's a guy called Rocky Balboa, you may remember. And uh, Rocky was one of the anti-apartheid activists in South Africa. And in the 1980s, he led a lot of the anti-apartheid -act anti activism at his university. And so we always had this little card just to remind us from Rocky. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's, all very, it's a very mean and nasty place. And I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward, how, mu how much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. And that was our relationship. And he, he also taught me of the Hindu, much about the Hindu religion. And uh, if I'm born again, I want to be born a Hindu. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me about Ganesh, and Ganesh is the, the god of removing obstructions. And we would pray to Ganesh every day at the start of the trial <laughs> to remove the obstructions for that day. And then the famous group came, Nina Taishalt, whom you'll know, who is right here in the front. These were my three expert witnesses. Sorry, can we get back? Sorry, something's happened now. I've obviously pressed. There we go. So I had three expert witnesses. I gave nine days' testimony. Nina Taishalt gave a day's testimony. She was so good that the prosecutor couldn't cross-examine her. He was completely <laughs> flawed. <laughs> Zoe Harcom from Wales, who just completed her PhD, showing that there was never any evidence to prove the low carb, the, sorry, the high, the high carbohydrate, low-fat diet is beneficial. That was her PhD. And then my great friend, Karen Zinn from New Zealand, who I taught to prescribe high carbohydrate diets in South Africa. Then she went to New Zealand, and it was so funny because when she got there about four years ago, her professor said to her, you know, I've heard about this low-carb story. I know it's rubbish. Just go and examine it. So she went and examined it. She came back and said, Prof, I'm sorry. We're all wrong. We've got to change. And he changed, and that's Grant Schofield, and he's changed his teaching and written books now with her. So these were the three, three expert witnesses who just destroyed the, the rest of the, of the, of the prosecution. So in the presentations, I gave 10 lectures, and those are on, on the internet under the Noakes Foundation. You can see them all. And that, my, my legal team said, you must just nail them with the science. And it was so funny because the error the prosecution made was to make it on science. And we, every time we brought out another lecture, the prosecution lawyer would say, do we have to have another lecture? <laughs> 
And the advocate said, yes, because it's about evidence. You said it was unconventional evidence. Well, he's just defending himself, and he's allowed to defend himself. And here, the, the, the videos are all on the Noakes Foundation. If you want to see the whole 84 videos, each about 20 minutes of the whole trial. And then ultimately, we wrote this book, and it came out in November, and it describes everything about the trial. Unfortunately, it's been difficult to get a hold of on Amazon. We are now reproducing it, and it will be pub released in, in America and Europe more recently, uh, within a few months' time. But what I realized about this book is that it's, it's also far too in information dense. That's the problem. And it really explains exactly why the dietary advice is all wrong. But it's again, it's still at that level that's too high for most people. And so now I'm working on Law of Nutrition 2, which is exposing the diet lies or the dietary lies, because that's what they are. And someone has to say it, they're lies. And we've been lied to, and it's time we, we got people to understand that we've got to get rid of the lies. And so that will be the next book, and I hope it'll be quite short, and that, so that when a person comes and says, the doctor says that my cholesterol's gone up, I'm gonna have a heart attack, say, well, actually, just read this book, it's not quite that simple. What's happened to your glucose and your insulin resistance? So, oh, sorry, 50 years ago, this is the other point, 50 years ago, I was in the United States, and in fact, I was probably in Washington, D.C. at the time, because I spent a year at a high school in Los Angeles, the most amazing year of my life. It was unbelievable. It was 1967, 68, when the whole of the world changed. That was one of the, the pivotal years in life. And things changed. It was exactly 50 years ago. And 50 years ago, Martin Luther King was murdered. And I've always loved this statement. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And that's what we hear about. This, this dietary advice is the worst thing that's ever happened in medicine. I don't think there's anything that matches it. And we have to keep fighting. And we have to honor all the people who've, who've said things like this. We, we can't stop. We have to fight it. When I go home to South Africa and I see the poor people and the way they're eating and their ill health, we have to change that. It, it, it's, it's simply genocide. It's a terrible word, but that's the reality. The diets kill, it's just killing populations. And we have to stand up against it. So thank you very much for your attention.